Welcome to Everlasting Life Media Ministries. I am your program host today, Michelle Vanon. and I'm coming to you from the Central Ohio Association of Christian Broadcasters. Amen. Today, what we're going to be going over is the Beatitudes. We're going to be talking about what Christ preached on. Glory to God. When he began to preach to the masses, I want you to pay attention to the facts. When we begin to read the scriptures, it's good to have a tablet, a pen, or if you have a computer so you can type up your notes and review those notes. The scripture tells us to meditate on the word day and night. And it's important so that we can allow God's word to be rooted in us and grounded in us because there's going to be a season and a time where we may come through a test. And when you come through a test, you're going to need the word in a, in, a, in a sure place on the inside of your soul. So here, Christ is speaking corporately, not individually, but corporately. And I believe that through these particular passages, he's not just revealing something individual to each individual, but that he's revealing something about community. He's revealing something about the nation. He's revealing something to the nation. Amen. So it says here in the third verse, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to start right here with this particular passage, and I want to meditate on that for just a moment. It says, blessed, blessed also means happy, okay? And so it comes from, um, it has a Hebrew, uh, when you look at the Hebrew translation, it also means happy, not just blessed. We say blessed, but it means happy is the person. In other words, you're going to be established. This is going to make you happy. Maybe you don't feel happy right now, but eventually it's going to bring about a wholeness or a good result. Amen. So he's saying when you're poor in spirit. So I had to really look up the word poor in spirit. And when I looked up the word uh, in Hebrew, it has some different meanings to it that means um, in a place in a low place. It means to be bowed down. I looked at the word blessed in Hebrew also, and it also means to bow down. So when, when God is saying that that person is blessed, he's saying that he's bowing down to them. He's coming down where they are. Uh, it's, it's a way of God saying, this is how God comes close to you. This is a way for God to come into your atmosphere. If you want to feel God's spirit, this is a way that God will come down and bless you. Amen. And it says, when you bow down to him, when you bow down in a place of humility, I see a lot of people challenge God in this hour. They'll say, well, if God is good, then why does God do this? And if God is this, then why did God, God does he allow sickness or death or uh, illness or these different things? And these things have come into the earth because of a corporate because of a corporate decision. This isn't an individual decision. Somebody over here was making a good decision, but you have several people over here that are making bad decisions. This is why he says, pray ye one for another, love one another, forgive one another. When you can't forgive somebody and you can't love somebody, it inhibits us corporately. It inhibits the corporate body. There's people that I'm not around. Uh, maybe they live far away in different states, but I begin to pray for them. And I begin to ask, God to bring a reconciliation because even though they're far away, there is a oneness that we must have in the body of Christ. There is a unity that is needed and it can't come unless there's real forgiveness, true forgiveness from the heart. And sometimes when we don't feel like we could trust a person or be around a person, we have to begin to pray for that person. You have to pray until that hard place in your heart is gone, until God removes the heart of stone and he puts in it a heart of flesh. When we look at the actual grave that Christ was buried in, there was a stone that was placed in front of it for a reason because it represents, it's indicative of the word of God going into a dead place and removing that stone that's in front of the heart. Are you hearing me? It's a stony place. It's a hard place. It's a place of death. It's a place called the grave. If you have unforgiveness and offense, you have a graveyard in your heart. Uh -huh. You've got a grave in there. And God wants to bring life out of that grave. And the only way to get life into the grave that is now your heart, he has to put the word of God in there. And he has to resurrect the word where the word can come out, where the word can be seen. I love you. Whoever you are, glory to God, I love you. I tell you that Jesus loves you. I know it sounds so simplistic, and I know it sounds so cliche, but it's true. He really, really loves you. He loves you, and he's a good God. But sin is bad. Sin brings illness and sicknesses. 
There are curses that he tells us in the Bible will come upon the children of Israel when they sacrifice their children. That's abortion in our country. He tells us there are sins. Glory to God, when you, I, when you worship demon spirits, the spirit of Baal is the spirit of materialism. It's the spirit where you care more about money than you care about people. You don't care about people. But God made people. People are made. The, the, the humanity was made, Adam, in the image and the likeness of God. You can't, not, you can't take a disposition of not caring about people and say that you care about God. Amen? You have to care for people. Care about the decisions. If you're in corporate America and you're hearing me and you're making decisions that are adversely affecting people, that are in subordination to you, you're accountable. You're accountable when you put money before people, when that money means more to you than that hum the human condition of their suffering. Amen? And so here he says you're blessed. He's speaking to the multitudes when you're in a bowed down place in your spirit before him when you're poor in spirit because he's saying this person will take possession of the kingdom of heaven and when you look at heaven there are pluralities when we want to examine the scripture we're going to take a look in the book of ephesians the first chapter the bible says here to the believer those that hear and believe the word of God. It says that in the fourth verse, according as he hath chosen us, those of the body of Christ, in him before the foundation of the world. You were chosen to believe in Jesus Christ, to become a part of the body of Christ before he ever laid the foundation of the world. Think about that. In Jeremiah 1, 5, he says, before I formed you, Jeremiah, I knew you. How did he know you before he even formed the earth and you ever came into existence in the earth realm? This is a mystery, saints. This is a mystery, people of God. This is a mystery to, tho to those that want to know God. Are you hearing me? This is a mystery because how could he know you? He knew you because you came out of him. And he knows all things. The Bible says he searches the reins of the heart. The reins is that what controls the motive of, of what you do and where you go. When you have reins on a horse, you pull those reins back and the horse will stop. You, you, you uh, hit that rein a certain way and the horse will move forward. Because the reins are controlling the horse. And when he says he's searching the reins of your heart, he's telling you he's searching what is the underlying motive of what's controlling your actions. Hear me. Because some people are under influence of a spirit and you can't get free because something else is controlling you. You try to stop, but you can't. You're given over to the lust of the flesh or you're given over to the desires that go against the grain of what God's spirit and what God's word is calling you to do. And God loves you. He wants you to let him come into your heart in totality so that your heart, when your heart is in love with Christ, that is what's going to control what you do and what you say and the decisions that you make. He said, if you love me, obey me. Amen? If you love him, if you love God, you'll obey God because you love him so much. You love God. It's our love for him that draws us to make those decisions that are righteous and that are holy. The Bible says in 1 Peter, it tells us to be ye holy, even as I am holy, saith the Lord. Holiness is God's attribute. Holiness is his character. That's his spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit is called the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Ghost is called the Holy Ghost. That's the very breath of God. 
That's the very life of God is holiness. And so if you're a Christian, you can't embrace Christianity and the God that you say you love without understanding that he is also holy. He's holy. Well, how does that look? Is holiness in a long skirt? No, although I enjoy wearing them <laughs> from time to time. Is holiness in, 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 although I'm not saying that some people dress that way because they feel like that, you know, is a disposition of holiness, but holiness is a condition of the heart. Holiness will make you forgive. Holiness will make, cause you to love people from every race and every kindred and every tongue and every nation. Holiness will cause you to rise above what is going on in the society and what the community says you should think like, and it'll cause you to think like Christ. What did Christ do? What did Jesus do? He loved, he forgave, but he also told the truth. When he encounters the woman that was caught in adultery, he says, where are your accusers? Because he's a teacher. And, and, and he, was, he was known as rabbi to the disciples. He says, where are your accusers? And she says, they have all left. And he says, neither do I accuse you. He knew the condition of her heart and that she had already repented. She was facing death because of her sin and because of her adultery, because of her actions. So when somebody came in to rescue her, and it, it was the Lord Jesus Christ, she knew this is God rescuing me. She had already cried out to God. She had already repented in her heart. He knew that. So he tells her, go and sin no more. Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. He doesn't just say, neither do I accuse you but he also says go and sin no more can God forgive me for lesbianism you're asking he can and he will but you must repent can God forgive you some of you are asking for molesting a child he can and he will but you cannot continue to sin against another human being you cannot do that Can he forgive you for stealing and robbing your family members? He can and he will, but you have to go and sin no more. You cannot continue in your sin. It will eternally separate you from God. Do you hear me? We have many preachers that preach different sermons on faith, but they won't preach about sin. Sin destroys even after you're forgiven of your sin, that sin continues to breed all kinds of destructive things throughout your family and within the community and into other people's souls. So sin is serious. And all of us have this serious problem of sin. You're never without sin. Sin doesn't have to be stealing, lying, cheating, or sexual immorality. Sin can also be the way you speak to people, the tone of your voice. I hear some people say, well, that's, that's this or that's ghetto. No, that's unkind to curse at somebody. That's unkind to be rude to somebody. That's unkind to talk down to somebody. You're in a position of leadership or you're a boss or you're a manager or, or uh, trying to be a manager and you're mistreating people that are in subordination to you because you have the ability to do so. You're accountable. You're accountable. You can be a good leader and a firm leader, and a strong leader, without being an abusive leader. How do you reduce conflict? Most of the time that you reduce conflict is choosing your words carefully and making sure that your heart is right with God and right with those people. Because sometimes you can speak a certain way, but your heart's not right and it can still be felt. Did you know that there's an energy that, is, that, that comes out of your soul towards people. That's why God said, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Most of the time you see cancer, and I'm not saying all the time, it can happen, it could be hereditary, it could be an attack from the devil, but a lot of times there is a prelude of unforgiveness. It's the mercy of God. It's the mercy of God that is upon our lives. It's the mercy. All of us need mercy. That person needs mercy. And if that person is continuing in their sin and continuing in their evil, 
I want you to know that God knows those things and he is the judge. But not until you forgive them can God even deal with them because you're standing in his way. You're standing in the way. The Bible said, blessed is the man that stands not in the way of sinners. Don't stand in the way of God. Forgive. Forgive. Release. Forgive them. Well, Sister Michelle, I don't want them to come into my home. They did this to my child. I understand that. I'm not saying they should come into your home. But forgive them. This soul is lost. The soul is lost that continues in sin. There's an eternal destination for those that continue in sin and will eternally be separated from God. They refuse to repent. They refuse to turn. They continue to hold to their own thinking. There's an eternal judgment that will come to them. And that's between them and God. You cannot force a person to serve the Lord. Maybe you're a family member praying for a loved one. Don't give up hope. Continue to pray for them. Remember that they will be eternally lost. Not just lost in the earth, but eternally lost. Where do you find the strength to continue to pray? In the presence of God. Saints, we have to have prayer meetings. We have to have prayer gatherings. We have to come together in a humble heart. We have so much pride in our society and so much pride even amongst church uh, affiliations. There is no pride with Christ. The Bible says that he thought it not robbery to be stripped and to die and to be crucified on the cross. Who is Christ? Who is he? Do you know who he is? Do you know who Christ really is? Do you hear the voice of God? Are you hearing him through scripture? Are you hearing him in the spirit? Because Christ humbled himself. He was lowly in character. He was not prideful. He was not high-minded. He was not lofty. He did not look down on people. He did not judge them in a critical and a harsh manner. He had love for those that other people threw away in society. Many times people look at people that are homeless or downtrodden and you really don't know what their path has been. You really don't know what brought them. You don't know why. Some of them are mentally ill. Some of them have had nervous breakdowns because of sin. Many times it has been sins of others that have affected them that then caused them to get stuck in a cycle where they could not come out and they became bound to demon powers. And this is real. This is really, really real. There are people that wanted to be set free, but could not get set free. There are people that are struggling now to get free, but they're a prisoner in their own mind. They're imprisoned by what Satan keeps bringing up to them from the past. They're imprisoned that why did you allow me to be raped? Why did you allow me to be molested? Why did you let my father leave us? Why did you let our mother run off? Why was my dad an alcoholic? Why did he beat my mother? Why did the pastor uh, uh, do this or, 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 or uh, uh, cause our family to leave the church? Why, why, why? I want to tell you that you have to let the why go and give it to God and begin to ask God what is it that you want from me what is it do you desire from me hear the word of the lord god loves you but you must come into a place where you can become and in order to become you have to leave where you are and let go of the offense and come into the place that god is calling you to i have talked to people that are in their 80s almost their 90s that are still hurting over things that happen in their early young adulthood or even their childhood because there is a life path path there is a life path that we flow through and it's like it's all connected even though you could be sitting at the age of 60 or 70 or 80 you still remember when you were four or five or eight or nine you still remember the scars God is saying come to me because I am the Aleph I am the Alpha I am the Omega I am the beginning and the end I was there when he left you I was there when you were left with three children to take care of and not enough money to be able to put food in the refrigerator I was there when your aunt had cancer that was taking care of you or your grandmother died and your whole life fell apart. I was there. 
I am the Aleph, he says, in the book of Revelation, the first chapter. And I am the Omega. I am the beginning. And I am the end. And in the end, what's going to matter is the eternal salvation. It's going to matter where we eternally live. The Lord strengthened this viewing audience. I speak a word to every person that is watching me. And I command right now in the name of Jesus... The strength of God to come where you are for you to forgive. The strength of God to loose you from the bands of bitterness. The strength of God to begin to heal your vision. Some of you are having some issues with your vision. I pray your vision in the spirit will be repaired and your vision in the natural. I pray the healing power of God, the healing balm of Gilead come upon you right now. Some of you have been raped. Some of you have been hurt. You've been molested and you've never even told. And some of you have told and nothing was done. And you felt that life is unjust. But I speak the healing power of God. God is a just God. And he's a loving and a forgiving and a merciful God. I pray that the power of God will come upon you to forgive. The power of God will come upon you to be healed. The power of God will come upon you to loose you. To bring you out of captivity. And to loose the bondages. And the, and the bonds of hell and death. Right now in the name of Jesus. I loose the spirit of deliverance into your living room. The spirit of deliverance into your kitchen. The spirit of deliverance into your basement. The spirit of deliverance spirit of deliverance to wherever you are in the anointing and the authority of Jesus Christ eternal and holy name he's a deliverer he came to set the captive free I'm going to read the book of Romans the 8th chapter in collaboration and again we were ministering out of Matthew the 5th chapter we're going to go to Romans the eighth chapter. Hallelujah. And it says here, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus that walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Once you have repented, you are forgiven of sin and there is no condemnation. You are not condemned. I'm going to read down to the seventh verse. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For the law of the spirit. What is the law of the Spirit? The law of the Spirit is the Holy Spirit that seals you when you believe. When you give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ and you ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart to forgive you of your sins and come into your heart and wash away your sins, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God will begin to deal with you. Now, this is different than the baptism in the Holy Ghost, okay? But this is the same Spirit that lives inside of you. It's the Holy Spirit. He seals you. He comes into your heart. He, be, he seals your heart. And the Bible says that's a law. He, the Spirit of God is the law of the Spirit. In other words, when you get ready to tell a lie, the Holy Spirit will say, don't do that. He'll convict you. You feel bad. You feel ashamed. You know the Word of God. He's the Spirit inside of God's Word. And once you've heard the Word of God and you know the Word of God, you won't do it. The Bible says the very first ten commandment, commandment that God gave Moses that he wrote with the finger of God is thou shalt have no other God before me. TV cannot be a God. YouTube cannot be a God. Help us, Jesus. TikTok cannot be a God. The Internet cannot be a God. Your friends and your position cannot be a God. It doesn't supersede the word of God. Your wife cannot be God. Your children cannot be a God. Your, your grandchildren. Oh, God, I love my grandson. Angela, I love, I have a grandson, and I love my grandson. But my grandson is not before God. And it says here, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law, the letter of the law is not anything that anybody can obey in the full measure without the power of the spirit of God that was released in the earth after Christ died on the cross being on the inside of you. You have to yield, however, to the spirit of God. And I'm going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But when you get saved, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. 
But you have to yield to the Spirit. And as you yield to Him, when He begins to lead and guide you, and as you walk with Him, you're not, God's not walking with you. You should be walking with Him. Mm -hmm. When you're a baby, sometimes He's walking with you because you're pulling Him along. But when you grow up and you begin to mature in Christ, you begin to follow Him. We are followers of Christ. Amen? And so it says here in the scripture, it says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He took on flesh. The word of God made flesh is Christ. And for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law. In other words, there's a righteousness that has to be fulfilled by obeying God's law that no human being could do. But when God uh, gave us his spirit through Christ dying on the cross. Because when they pierced him in his side, the blood poured out, the water poured out and the spirit poured out first john 5 and 8 tells us these are the three witnesses amen and that what are they witness to they're witness to whose name is written in the lamb's book of life for one but they are also witness to who has accepted christ in their heart and who has received his spirit and it goes on to say for that they are after they that are after the flesh the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That person that's heart is after the flesh. They mind the things that are of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. Carnally minded. When you're always thinking fleshly or the things that please the flesh, that is a carnal mind. You want to smoke. You want to cuss. You want to do That's carnality. You've given your heart to Jesus, but you've not surrendered to the spirit of God. Because the carnal mind is enmity. That's never ending hatred against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. Do you want to be subject to the spirit of God today? Are you feeling the convicting power of the Holy Ghost right now? Do you know that your life isn't where it should be? Do you know that you're doing some things that are displeasing God's spirit? This is a good sign if you know it, because that means at some point, if you've given your life, the spirit of God is working on you and he's convicting you. But that doesn't mean that you're in the right place with God. And I have to be honest with you because this is his word. And if you want to be right with God, I want you to bow your head right now. Wherever you are, and say this prayer to God out of a sincere heart. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I'm a sinner. I'm in sin. I've given my heart to you, God. This is for the backslidden Christian and for those that have never given their life. I need you, God, because I don't have the strength to serve you. But I want to serve you. I don't want to be separated from God. I don't want to go to that place called hell. I believe Jesus died on the cross and raised from the grave on the third day. And I receive you now into my heart. If you've said that prayer, congratulations. You are born again. The Lord fill you now with his spirit. The Lord heal you now and lift you up forevermore. God bless you. We love you.